The New York Knicks absolutely nailed the draft this year. With pick 9, they snagged Kevin Knox, who has the athleticism and skill set to develop into a fantastic wing. And then with pick 36, they grabbed Mitchell Robinson, who has perhaps the most athletic potential in a big man I have seen taken in the second round. But the third win they had was when Alonzo Trier ended up going undrafted. The talented guard wasn't selected by any of the 30 teams, and the Knicks pounced and signed him to a two-way contract with their D-League affiliate. But throughout the preseason and in the first few regular season games, it has become clear that Trier has a place in the NBA and will be on a guaranteed contract sooner rather than later. This video will take a look at Trier as a player, how he fits in with the Knicks, both in the future and in their current guard rotation. But I wanted to begin by taking a look at the circumstances that led to Trier not getting drafted. Usually players that are this athletic with this scoring ability get drafted somewhere in the first round or at least the second, and it is so rare that they don't get drafted at all. Trio was an incredibly gifted high school player and was ranked as a five-star recruit by every major scouting organization. He then committed to playing at Arizona, where he would play for three whole seasons. This is incredibly rare these days, and Alonzo could have come out of college after just his first year but he chose to stay to continue to develop. But in his sophomore season, the controversy would begin. Trio tested positive for performance-hancing drugs and was suspended indefinitely. Ultimately, the report determined that Trio was administered these drugs after a car accident and did not take them for the purposes of gaining an advantage in competition. But the damage was already done. Some teams just don't want to deal with guys like this and their draft stock plummets as a result. This would not have been helped when Trier tested positive again in his junior season, but it turns out that this was just the remnants of the initial substance that he was suspended for. Once again though, the damage was already done, the damage to his reputation. Despite these setbacks, Trier dominated in the games that he played for Arizona. In his sophomore year, he was named the most outstanding player in the Pac-12 tournament, and in his junior year, he made first team Pac-12. Fantastic achievements for a player, and due to his athleticism, you would have expected him to go in the first round. But I think that the drug incidents and some questions over his commitment and attitude clouded the judgment of NBA teams, and he slipped through the cracks, right into the hands of the Knicks. In the preseason, Trier began by getting small amounts of minutes off the bench. The Knicks were trying to evaluate the huge amounts of guards that they had. Frank Nilakina, Trey Burke, Emmanuel Moutier, Damian Dotson, Ron Baker, and Tim Hardaway Jr. were all competing for minutes alongside Trier. But as the preseason went along, it became clear that aside from Nilakina, Burke, and Hardaway, Trier was just a cut above the rest in terms of skill, potential, and athleticism. And that's the first thing that stands out about Trier. He is an athlete. He's six foot five and quite lean, but appears to have some strength in his frame. And alongside this is his speed. Alonzo has a great first step and has been using it to blow right by slower defenders and get inside the paint. He also has great leaping ability and this allows him to get up above the rim and finish over big defenders who have come over to help, and also to finish through contact. This athleticism will also give Trier the potential to eventually become a strong positive defender. He hasn't shown this ability yet, but Fisdale and the coaching staff of the Knicks will be hoping that they can coach him into a good to great defensive player. He has the speed and length to stay in front and harass players, but just doesn't have the commitment or the defensive IQ to do this effectively yet. If he wants to be more than a bench scorer and guard, he will need to commit to learning this. As to be a starter in the NBA without playing defense, you have to be godly in terms of scoring and offensive ability. Think James Harden levels of offense. And while Trier isn't ever going to be James Harden on offense, he is a very skilled player and capable scorer. Funnily enough, his go-to move appears to be a step-back jumper, similar to Harden. But instead of pulling back to the three-point line, Trier prefers to step back to the free-throw line. He does this by getting past his defender, imitating some contact, and then using his incredibly long legs to fly backwards before rising up for the jumper. And this shot just goes in. Alonso knocks him down with fantastic regularity, and most defenders can't get into his space to disrupt this shot due to his high jump and long back step. He's also fantastic at finishing at the rim and uses his long arms, quick speed, and hops to get to the rim before defenders and finish off the glass or straight in the lane. He demonstrated this in his first game of the regular season when he drove hard to the rim and put Torian Prince on a poster. And this demonstrates another of his skills and traits that is desirable, his confidence. 
Trier simply has that belief and swagger that he's the best player on the court every time he steps out there. This will help him ride the highs and lows of his rookie season and keep him shooting and aggressive every single game. He's also shown some ability to run in the pick and roll, but he tends to use the screens as a way to in initiate his scoring. Tria comes off them and is very aggressive, taking advantage of the space and separation that the big man has created for him. But teams will begin to realize that he is looking to score for the most part when he comes off screens, and they'll begin to trap him. These double teams will make it tough for Tria, and he'll have to learn to pass more out of the screen and roll. This is an area in general where I think that Tria will have to work on. I think during the preseason, he was trying to show that he deserved a spot on the team and minutes. So he went into hyper-aggressive scoring mode to strut his stuff. And it worked, and I don't blame him for doing it. But if he wants to contribute to a winning team in the future, he needs to become a more balanced player. And the Knicks bench should give him the opportunity to do so. He will be playing a lot of his minutes alongside Noah Vonley, Mario Hazonia, Ron Baker, and then likely Courtney Lee, Kevin Knox, or one of the starters. These guys are all capable shooters, and Vonley is a decent pick-and-roll partner. It would be fantastic to see Trier try and take responsibility here and use his scoring threat to collapse defenses and create for his teammates. I think this is likely something that will come with time, and the more minutes he plays, the more he'll begin to create for the bench unit as he gets used to the NBA. And this is the problem that Trio will sort of create for the Knicks. How many minutes can they get the young, talented guard? On opening night, the Knicks started Trey Burke and Hardaway Jr. at the guard spots, and then started Neil Aquina as a defensive small forward and a third guard on offense. Then they have Baker, Dotson, and Moutier, who can also come off the bench alongside Trio. I think as the season goes on, Moutier will get next to no minutes and might even get cut and Dotson will struggle to find minutes unless there are injuries or his good shooting stays constant. And I feel kind of bad for Dotson in this regard. He has talent, shows grit on defense, and I think he can be a good player in the future. But the emergence of Trier might cost him some of his minutes in the rotation, and could even cost him his spot on the team if the Knicks decide they want to keep Moutier. Because Trier can only play 45 games with the Knicks on his current contract. Once these games are done, I expect the Knicks to sign him to a new contract that either lasts the rest of the year or beyond. He already appears to be a big part of their rotation, and Moutier and Dotson got no minutes in the opening night, and Dotson eventually got some minutes in their third game. For these reasons, I think the Knicks might part ways with Moutier, who is a failed experiment at this point in time for their franchise, and maybe even in the NBA. Moutier might be fast, strong, and big for a guard, but he has next to no basketball IQ, no shooting ability, and struggles to finish at the rim. I think that Moutier is sadly in for a shock at the end of this year when he enters the restricted free agency market and finds very few suitors. If I was the Knicks, here's who I would be cutting, as I think Dotson is a decent injury depth and could even develop into a good defense and three-point shooting guard, and Luke Cornett could still develop into a decent bench big also. The question will likely end up being, how much will some team offer Trier and for how many years? If he keeps up this level of play, many teams will be in the market for a young guy who is athletic and has shown the ability to score off of the bench. And because he wasn't drafted and is signed to a two-way contract, there are very few limitations to how much money other teams can offer him after this season. But while this might be the case, I think the Knicks could probably secure him on a two-year deal for a little bit above two to four million a year. If he keeps up this level of play, it will be impressive but it will be on a losing team, and teams might not be willing to take the risks on him. I think this kind of deal would be a win for the Knicks, as it gives them a good, cheap bench piece, and would also be useful for Trier, who would have stability and be able to continue to develop in New York before looking for a bigger deal. Because, as I mentioned above, Trier still needs to develop. He needs to work on pick and roll play, passing, and his defensive consistency. But there is no doubt in my mind that he will be able to contribute this entire season in a bench role. But there will be a lot of up and downs this year. He isn't going to drop 15 points every game off the bench, and there will be nights when he struggles to really score at all. I imagine the Knicks coaching staff are well prepared for this and aren't expecting a consistent 15 points a night from him. Besides, this season is all about development from the Knicks' point of view. They are starting Nila Kina at small forward, just so that they can get as many minutes into him as possible. This is the biggest sign of them focusing on developing players, and not necessarily wins. They are incentivized to do this for two reasons. They have a lot of youth, and these players need the time on NBA courts if they are going to reach their full potential. The second reason is the most crucial though. 
the Knicks will be without Chris Tapp's Pazingas for the first good stretch of the season. They'll want to be cautious with bringing him back from his ACL injury to ensure that he makes a full recovery and returns to his best self. I cannot foresee the Knicks winning enough games without KP to stay afloat and compete for the playoffs. For this reason, it makes sense to go the other way. Not try and lose games, but put yourself in the position where developing the youth results in more losses than normal. I think there are also less truly terrible teams than last year, as Phoenix added Ayton and the Mavericks added Luka. I also think that the Chicago and Brooklyn are just better than the Knicks, and this means that they could leapfrog into the worst five teams in the league and secure themselves a top five draft pick or higher. And as mentioned a huge amount of times by analysts, this draft is stacked at the top. With Zion, RJ Barrett, Cam Reddish, and Nassir Little in the mix, there is the potential for the Knicks to add another extremely talented player to their roster. With this to go alongside Porzingis, Neil Aquina, Kevin Knox, and then Mitchell Robinson, I think they have a good chance at developing a fantastic starting lineup for the future. And for me, this allows them to develop guys like Tria into great bench pieces who have specific roles to complement the team. Tria can be that go-to scorer off the bench in the future who leads the team while the starters rest. And if he continues to work on his three ball and specifically off the catch and shoot, he could be a great player to have mix in with the starters. He'll be able to play good minutes alongside the starters while one of them rests and just shoot threes and defend on the other side. This is the kind of versatile player the Knicks will be trying to develop this season in Trier. If he can become that kind of player who can score in bunches as well as act as a role player, he'll be incredibly valuable for the Knicks' long-term future. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications as well. And let me know in the comments below what you think of Tria and the New York Knicks.